Hey, welcome back to the Young, Wild, and Rich podcast. I'm your host, Dane Camella. Thank you for tuning in to yet again another episode. We have an interview this week I'm super pumped about for episode number 88, and I'm sitting down with a guest I've known since middle school, Copper Ridge days, Asa Pitt. You might know him, you might not know him. I'm really excited to be bringing him on. Asa has to be one of the scrappiest dudes in the show business industry. That's what we're going to be getting into today. He's an entertainment lawyer. He's been a set production assistant, budding Instagram influencer. No task is above or below him. He has all sorts of weird stories from law school to movie studios and talent agencies, as well as a ton of advice for people wanting to get into this industry. I'd want this guy on my team if he was working in the same industry as me. He's scrappy, he's willing to do whatever it takes, and he shares so many different examples from when he was waking up super early, running around, doing law school, trying to you know land different agency jobs from gigs to production assistants. It's an incredible story, and he's got a great outlook on life, and I think that's one of the biggest things that makes up the type of person I want to have on this show when it comes to a young professional. So we're going to get into Asa Pitt's story. We're going to talk about his experience getting his law degree, why he did that, as well as for those of you who personally know Asa, he was willing to discuss in this episode the influence his dad, nationally renowned forensic psychiatrist, the late Dr. Stephen Pitt, had on his career, and Asa's point of view on the national news coverage surrounding his dad's murder. So we do cover a lot in this episode, and I do think if you sit down and listen to the entire thing, whether that's in one or two sittings, you're going to get a lot out of it. Asa is a prime example of someone who I look up to and inspires me, who looks at life as full of opportunities and life is what you make it but you don't have to take it too seriously you can have fun along the way so let's jump in to my interview with asa pitt episode number 88 asa welcome to the show dane thanks for having me dude of course man we go back to the copper ridge days as well as shap town so never forget baby copper ridge there. blazers and shap town usa <laughs> shap town, shap -town. USA. so let's get into it man we are going to start in college like we always do Tell us a little bit about where you went to college and then what you majored in. Yeah, so I went to the University of Arizona, Bear Down, down in the Dirty T. You know, as I'm sure you've heard from a lot of people, it's a really fun school. I had a great time and would not trade that experience for anything. Um, when I went down to the Dirty T, I decided to major in psychology, kind of knowing I could swing that either way towards med school or law school. At the time, I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do, but I know with a BA, you could swing that towards, uh, you know, law school, BS towards med school. You know, I always was interested in math and the sciences, uh, you know, conceptually, but I wasn't that great at executing those concepts. Um, and I always excelled a lot more in reading, writing, and communicating with other people. So I decided to do the BA, um, you know, with the foresight that I would head towards uh, law school. And then I also minored in communication. And I know that everybody just rips on communication saying that, mm -hmm. you know, it's uh, it's for dumb people and it, and it doesn't really do anything for you. But I think if you look what's going on in our country in a complete like disarray of social discourse, I think it's a highly uh, underrated major because it's pretty clear to me that most people do not know how to communicate effectively. A hundred percent. Now, let me ask you this. I've had guests on who have taken their time graduating. Maybe it was four or five, six years. I myself took time off in between community college as well as uh, going to ASU. So the graduation time frame for me was a little bit longer. Did you graduate in four years or did you take longer or shorter? I was actually able to do it in three and a half, which was awesome. I thought in that last semester I'd be coming back a lot, but I actually didn't. And I was able to graduate mm -hmm. a little early because I did an internship at Entertainment Tonight, which I'm sure we'll talk about more later, where I was just able to rack up credits. I think I got two classes for that because I was working Monday through Friday full time over a summer. And then I also took just a couple extra classes in college. So I'd have six classes some semesters, some semesters. And usually I would just do a gen ed or something. I think I did like rock and American pop in the 21st century just because, you know, like my parents and mentors encouraged me to just try a couple classes. You know, you're there and there are some experts in fields that you're probably never going to learn about again. So just go try something. And those classes, quite frankly, aren't that hard. But those credits still count towards graduation. So I rolled up to meet with my counselor for, you know, what I thought was my senior year. And I found out I was already in my senior year and I only had four classes left. And they said, do you want to split this up into two semesters or 
or do you want to do it in a one? And I was like, well, four classes is less than the standard five anyways. And I used uh, the would be last semester to work for a home builders group at Meritage Homes. I saved up a bunch of money and then I went and blew it over the summer uh, traveling to Europe with my <laughs> boys. And then I think I went right into working at a summer camp after that. So that was a great summer. Very cool, man. And I have to ask you this because I ask everyone who comes onto the show, if you were sitting down with someone who was, you know, 18, 19 years old and thinking about college and should I go to it? I mean, I mean, it's a big conversation today and I know it's a difficult question to answer because it's very case dependent on the person. Everyone has a different answer who's come onto the show too. But I'm curious for you if someone was asking you, hey, I want to go into maybe the entertainment industry, some, some in, uh, the industry you've been in all of this time. What advice would you share to them on your thoughts around that? So I would say that it really depends on what you want to do. For my field, it seems like a lot of the people hiring at this juncture in time want, you know, people with college degrees, which quite frankly, I think is silly because the entry level jobs in the entertainment industry come down to being an assistant or a production assistant. And that what that boils down to is scheduling um, answering phones, working long hours and having an opinion about, you know, different scripts and treatments that you're reading, which quite frankly, an eighth grader can do. It's just a question of, can you handle the pressure and are you a responsible person? And they think that if you go to college, then you check those boxes. Um, I don't think you need to go to college to check those boxes, but that's what they're looking for right now. As far as going to a big university, uh, right out of the gate, I don't really think that's necessary. I think that if you still kind of want to know more about what you're going to do, or even if you do know what you're going to do, I think the move honestly is to go to a community college for the first two years because it's way cheaper uh, than the typical in-state tuition that you're going to get. And you're going to learn all the same stuff. You're just getting these silly gen eds out of the way anyways. Um, and you don't even get into your major or the interesting stuff until really like the end of your sophomore, junior and senior year. I couldn't agree with you more because that's what I did. I did two years at Scottsdale Community College, and it was extremely cheap. I, I mean, it might have been five grand for the two years, right. maybe less. I got scholarships, too. That's and, the move. Dude, there was there was a scholarship I got for playing football in high school. I got $500. Dude, that's that sick. I actually had a scholarship for that. <laughs> I, so, I mean... Like, are you are you from Shaptown? I'm going to give you 500 bucks. Like, what? For me, you know, I, I felt blessed. I was fortunately on the Steve Pitt Scholarship Foundation, which is, you know, that's my dad. And, you know, I feel blessed that my education was paid for me in that sense. But I, I think if you're paying for it yourself, the move is for sure to go to community college, crush those classes, and then get a scholarship heading into, you know, your junior, senior year. You might miss out on a couple parties, but it's honestly not that important. So looking back on your college experience outside of recommending it to someone else, how would you define that experience yourself? Was it worth it? Would you still go? Did you get a lot out of it? I'd love to know from your personal I got a ton out of college. I think college is what you make of it. You can be the person that never goes to class and sleep in and kind of skimp by, or you can take it seriously, but also play hard too. So for me, you know, I was somebody who was at all my classes and, but then I would also go out and party too. It's like, all right, if you're going out on Thursday and you have that Friday, 8 a.m., your ass is going to be there no matter how hungover you are. So I, I really think what I learned in college though, more than anything else is the system and how to play in the system and how to be, you know, kind of a responsible person on your own. Do I think that that's necessary? And do I think a lot of people have, do I think it's necessary? No. And I think it's actually a skill set that a lot of people have before they were going to college, but just the overall encompassing experience was, yeah, it was super fun. 10 out of 10 strongly recommend, but that's not to say that I couldn't have spent those four years doing something else that would have been just as productive, if not more. For example, you know, if I had an idea to start my own business doing it, or if I wanted to come out to mm -hmm. LA early and start working on sets and writing, you know, or maybe, um, like learning, you know, coding is a big thing right now. I know people that are going to school for a year and then making salaries that are six figures right out of the gate. Um, mm -hmm. so for me and my path, I strongly recommend it, but I really think it just comes down to the individual. Totally. And then you mentioned that you went on that trip with your buddies, blew the money you made in the internships and some of the jobs you had as you were finishing up college. And then you did mention you came 
you came back from that trip and you went to camp. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that summer camp and what after that was like. after I went on that trip, I went and worked at Camp Tamarack, which is a place that I had gone to forever as a kid. And uh, my dad and uncle went there. It's a camp out in Michigan, a Jewish sleepaway summer camp. And really all that means is that they celebrate Shabbat, which is basically like our Sunday services and they keep kosher and they're pro-Israel. But it's like half the staff are made up of international staff who are not Jewish. And I'd probably say about 10% okay. plus of the kids are not Jewish. And, and other than those things, you wouldn't even know that it's a Jewish summer camp. Um, but I, I would strongly recommend that every single kid should have to go to summer camp to kind of learn how to be independent and be on your own from a, from a young age. And then I also recommend that everybody should be a counselor at a summer camp because, you know, that's when you learn how to be responsible. When That's the first time in my life that truly somebody else – was more important than me and my friends. You know what I mean? Because my job is to make sure that these kids have the most mm -hmm. fun time possible in the safest way possible. And that doesn't mean that there can't be some bumps and bruises or even like some serious injuries where kids break an arm or something like that. You don't want that to happen. But really, as long as these kids have the most fun ever, which is your job, uh, and they don't die, it's like a great summer. Strongly recommend. You're never going to feel that close to you know, other counselors and staff and, and be able to like laugh that hard for that long. Cause you're not with a computer, you know, you don't have your phone. You're just mm -hmm. with other people connecting and your sole purpose is to have a great time for two and a half months. <laughs> I completely agree with that too. I think also outside of being responsible and taking care of someone else and putting their needs in front of you. You learned a lot of leadership uh, skills in that as well. I mean, when I was going to college early on, 18, 19, 20, I worked at a sports sports performance facility as a trainer. And you have kids anywhere from six years old all the way up to 18, and they're getting ready to go to college. Or they maybe even are right to, like they're in their freshman year of being an athlete. And you have to have everyone work together and also have a fun time because they you want to get them to come back. So Doing that, like there's so many ways to put yourself in a position where you're looked at as a role model for someone young, but also it teaches you how to be more responsible, like you said, but also take on those leadership uh, components, which I think is huge. Absolutely, man. And and the thing is, is it's, it's a, you don't realize it at first, but when you're in one of those leadership roles, even if you're not a supervisor, but when you're a counselor, these kids look at you, they like, they think you're the coolest, you know, they think you're, you know, like a major mm -hmm. league athlete and they look up to you and they yep. listen to your, to your every word. So if you say something stupid or out of turn, like they're going to hear that and then go repeat it somewhere else. But the same goes mm -hmm. for the positive things that you say and, and the good messages that you're, that you're trying to teach these kids. And, and to me, that was the most rewarding part about it. I mean, you're not getting paid a bunch of money. Like, you know, your rent is free and your, and your food is free and you take home a little, a little check here and there, but you know, that's really not what it's about. It's about that growth for yourself and for the kids. Um, strongly recommend, strongly recommend. Definitely. So after camp ends, you find yourself getting out to LA and then law comes into that. Tell us a little bit about it, that. Yeah. So I kind of knew, you know, like I said, I figured out that I wanted to go to law school and law school is really for people who don't know what they're going to do next. And I kind of had an idea that I wanted to be in the entertainment industry. You know, as I mentioned, I did that internship at entertainment tonight, which really set me, uh, you know, or put me on course for this whole thing. But if you want to be in the entertainment industry, that pretty much leaves you with um, LA, New York, Miami and now Atlanta is becoming a, a big production hub. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, being from Arizona, LA is the closest. That's the place I was most familiar with. And uh, I just decided to go to law school out there. But I was really at Chapman Law, which isn't based in LA. It's more, um, it's more towards Orange County. But I just, you know, figure if I want to be in the industry and if I'm going to use – if I'm going to be a lawyer and if I'm going to use that status as a lawyer to supplement a career – in the entertainment industry that I should be barred in the place where I want to work, which, like I said, pretty much Definitely. boils down to uh, those four places I mentioned. And for me, I like film and television, and that's really L.A. You know, that's like L.A., Atlanta, and New York. Um, New York is too cold, and Atlanta is too far. So L.A., <laughs> LA it is. Yeah, and then, again, for anyone listening who – isn't too familiar about law school. What would you say from an experience standpoint? Was it 
was it a great experience? Did you learn a ton? And then how are kind of internships involved into that as well? I mean, law school is a, a good experience, but kind of one that you never really need to have again. It's like, so the way law school is set up, um, you come in with your, your track. So you're going to be with the same hundred people for all your classes. Uh, okay. there's like three tracks, right? So you're going to be with the same people for all your classes the first year. And the way the classes are set up is they send you home with reading and you read the, basically these case summaries that make no sense. Cause you don't know <laughs> the legal language yet. Um, and you come in and they, all the teachers pretty much teach off of the Socratic method, which is what that means is that they're just cold calling people. And if you get caught with your pants down, you know, you get caught with your pants down and you kind of look like an idiot and it is what it is. Some teachers dock you some teachers realize that it's just embarrassing enough and you don't want to be that person to have that reputation of the person who doesn't know what the fuck is going on. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, man, starting out, it's like rough because you got to really pause while you're reading things. You really got to pause and look at each sentence. If you don't know what a word means, stop, look it up, mm -hmm. try to make that make sense and circle back. And then you only, you're only getting graded once or twice a semester. So you might have a midterm, but usually there's just a final. And the thing that really pissed me off about law school, and I, I've heard similar sentiments from other uh, schools, is that nobody really tells you how to write a law school exam because the way a law school exam works is they give you like a couple stories, right? Okay. They just give you a few stories, something that's happening. Uh, for example, like if it's a criminal law class, they, you know, they give you some story where like Bob breaks into a house. He did it with this person, et cetera. Like tell me all of the things that Bob could be charged for. So they're like these open-ended questions and they're like, tell me what Barb, Bob could be charged for and what would his defense attorney argue on his behalf? So that's a very open-ended question. You just have to spot everything that's happening in there without anybody really telling you and memorize the legal concepts and then apply them right there. But which really isn't that hard, but it's hard because you're doing it for speed, right? You usually only have about an hour per prompt and there's, they're three hour long exams usually of just go, go, go. And mm -hmm. then the way it's graded is you're going up against all of your other classmates. So it's not like you get nine out of 10, that's an A. It's whoever gets the most points gets a hundred percent. And then it's just curved against everybody else. So only X amount of people can get an A, X amount of people have to fail, X amount of people have to get a C. Uh, do you see what I'm saying? Interesting. Yeah. No, and, that's, and, and that's I was just pissed because like I like I'm sitting there studying my ass off for this stuff and I, I really don't think I knew how to write an exam the first year. I really don't think I understood. Um, so you're putting in all this work and I got horrible grades my first semester. They were a little better the second. Um, I got it together in the second year and I was I was getting great grades, but still like I didn't even know a lot of the times, man. Like sometimes <laughs> there were a few times uh, I never was the best in the class in a particular subject, but there were a lot of times when I came in second place and there were times when I thought I did great and I failed and there were times where I thought I failed and I, I was like one of the top people in the class. So I, I don't know, man. I don't know. And a lot of people will tell you similar things. And it's interesting hearing your experience around it too, because a lot of people that I've, you know, had conversations with and how just getting a law degree is, is talked about is you have to be this specific type of person and it, you have to have this level of intelligence to be able to make it work. And it sounds like from your experience, it was a lot of up and down and, and you kind of figured your way out through it as you went through it versus saying, okay, I need to be this specific type of person. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it. Like from that first, did that first year really teach you or tell you, okay, I'm, I'm going to go through with this or, I mean, how many people just even give up after the first oh, year? Oh yeah. No, a lot, a lot of people do give up in the first year. And I mean, I got rocked in the first year. I got, you know, I just got punched in the face as hard as you could possibly <laughs> be punched in the face. Cause you, you think you're smart, <laughs> you know, you, like, you, you're like, oh, I made it to law school. I'm, I'm pretty, right. I'm okay. You know, I'm not going to fail. And, you know, I'm, I'm working really hard, which is true. You're like, you're studying your ass out. There's like, there's no way. Like, and you get your grades back and you're shocked. You can't 
can't believe it. <laughs> and um, I, I don't know. For me, I'm all about positivity and not making excuses and not taking this woe as me mentality because other people got a good grade. So why can't I get a good grade? And you can either sit there and pout about it or you can do something about it. So what I would do is I would go in and talk to the professors. They and so then, you know they knew to take me seriously and say, hey, where did I go wrong? What can I do to get better? And you just kind of go from there because at the end of the day, nobody really cares uh, what your GPA was in law school or how many times you had to take the bar. They care about, can you get the job done? And you, are you a person that I want to be around more than I'm going to be around my family? You know, that's, that's mm -hmm. really what it comes down to. Um, I think it takes a resilient person to be in law school. And if you don't get smacked in the face in law school, you're going to get smacked in the face somewhere else. Uh, so <laughs> it might as well happen there. So we know how you're going to respond, right? That's how I see it. Yeah, no, I, I I totally agree. And again, it, it it doesn't. It's not so much. Oh, you have to be the specific type of, you know, level of intelligence. It's just like, are you willing to go through the process? And exactly, it out and dude. Any more? dude to be real, <laughs> anybody could go to law school. Like, if you can read and write, you are capable of going to law school. It's just, are you really gonna sit down and do all of that reading and risk getting smacked in the face and and put down that money because it is expensive. Uh, betting on yourself that you're going to make it all back as an attorney or whatever else you do in life. Yeah. So it's a three-year process. What else are you kind of doing during this time as you're out in LA, you're going to you know Chapman Law, and, and then, again, it's a three-year process. So what else were you doing during that time? Were you you know trying to, were you, did you have another job too so you could make extra money? Like Right. I, I hear you. Um, no, I mean, I was living off of student loans and when those student loan checks come around, you think you're rich, but you're not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you got to pay it back. Um, the first year at my school they said you're not allowed to have a job because we just want you to get your grades right and I think the only people that were allowed to have jobs were in the second semester if they were towards the top of the class and you know like I said that was not me so no I did not have an internship my first year but I was plugging and trying to find internships for the summer and that's kind of the ball game the first year because it really comes down to your internships I think because that's where you're getting experience and that's what people are going to hire you on. What you learn in law school is not what you're going to be doing as an attorney or whatever else it is you decide to do. So for me, my, my track was a little different because I was interested in uh, things in film and, and at the beginning, not necessarily something on the legal side. So I wanted to be in development. So I found myself uh, like cold calling and cold emailing people spinning away that I could find my way into an internship. And fortunately I did. My first internship was at Imagine Entertainment, uh, which is a very well-known production company for um, television and film. It's run by Brian Grazer, who's one of the great producers of our time, and Ron Howard, who's considered one of the great directors of our time. You know, they did like, like Apollo 13, you know, the Friday Night Lights movie and television show and just tons of other movies and television things that you've seen. Mm -hmm. And I was actually just telling somebody in an interview the other day that uh, as like a kind of like another intro to Hollywood, uh, at least on the real like production development side, it was one of the greatest experience I could have ever asked for because the people were all incredibly nice. You know, I was included in these weekly production meetings where I was allowed to speak out and just share what I thought about a particular script and this is in front of like high level executives and Brian Grazer like who's going to respond mm. and then and then just talk about it with you and there's not really any, any better training than you can get than doing that and, and like I said they're all just nice and those internships are a lot of what you make of them so you like go mm -hmm. out of your way and ask for extra things to do like yeah you got to do the grunt work like you got to go pick up dry cleaning you have to go pick up coffee you have to you have to do the dishes you know, you have to refill the printers. Like, yeah, you, you're going to have to do that stuff, but that's what you get, dude. It's like, you know, it's like suck it up and get it done. And if you show them, you can do those basic things and that you're hungry and want to learn and go out of your way to put out, then you can start to do the cooler stuff, you know, whatever you consider that to be. Yeah, definitely. And then with that internship at Imagine Entertainment, did you, was that, did you, did you land that internship through what you were talking about, like cold calling, cold emailing? Because I think that just hearing that from someone who's looking to get into this industry is also super useful. Um, 
a little a little bit of both i mean i i actually you know that's not true it's not a little bit of both that one i mean i mean you know uh especially i guess i don't want to restart an american culture unfortunately but fortunately depending on how you look at it a lot of it is based on connections and mm -hmm. who you know and if you're somebody who likes to introduce yourself to people uh and make connections then it's kind of merit based in that sense but it's not necessarily merit based because they don't really know what to go off of for internships like that so i balled out at entertainment tonight and i because i balled out at entertainment tonight and i was a great intern then they're willing to introduce you to other people but there are plenty of people who show up to internships and twiddle their thumbs and just woe is me mm -hmm. and then you don't get introduced to other people and you're stuck um so no that one i got through connections at entertainment tonight Okay. And I mean, that's still important for anyone listening to this to know is, again, your your opportunities of tomorrow are also kind of created from what you've done in the past or those previous experiences. And what you obviously did at the first internship gave you the ability to have that credibility to say, hey, I can vouch for this person. They did an amazing job. They went above and beyond. And that's an easy in for someone to say, hey, we'll give you a shot. We'll, 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 we'll bring you into the fold and, and let you learn about this experience. When did you have that internship in your um, in your law school uh, time. Like oh yeah, so time, get right? this. This is hilarious. So <laughs> I did this in the summer uh, between my. It's called your first year is your one L, two L, three L, respectively. So okay. I did that between my one L and two year two L year. Um, the law school wouldn't give me credit for it because. Although, you know, like I came into it and said, yes, I want to learn about the law too. They didn't have in-house counsel, but there were some really crazy things going on that summer um, that I can talk about. Actually, I don't, I mean, it, this is public <laughs> information. I don't know if the case has been resolved, so I'm not going to tell you okay, exactly that I've seen. But basically what was happening is, on. remember that Tom Cruise movie, uh, American Made? Did you ever see that? American Made. It's Maybe sad. you didn't see it. It was like a Tom Cruise movie, like con like running, like the Contra uh, scandal, like gun running yes, and, and I that did. kind of I thing. Did. He was the pilot. Yes, exactly. So uh, that summer, and by the way, this is public information, <laughs> a plane crashed on that set when they were flying like people back and forth to the set because it was in the jungle and there was like some crazy stuff. And a plane crashed, sadly, and people died. So there were oh, lawsuits wow. surrounding that. There were, they didn't have in-house counsel, but we, we did bring in counsel to help with it. And then they brought me in um, to, to work with them. Like there were some airplane attorneys uh, and some other types of folks that came in. Um, I kind of sidetracked again. I keep doing it. It's just a lot to talk about. But anyway, the law school wouldn't give me credit for this internship because technically it's not a law internship it's like a film production internship so but the only way you can do the internship is to get school credit because right. a lot of these internships don't pay because they just know you're desperate to do it which you mm -hmm. are because it's it's hollywood and everybody's just dying to be in it mm -hmm. uh so i had to find a way to do that so what i did is while i was in law school i enrolled in a one unit community college class at um college of the canyons out in california and uh, I used that to get credit. So I was like also enrolled it in community college while I was enrolled in law school. And I just paid, it was like, you only had to pay like $200 to do it. And it was actually a pretty good class too. I had to like come in and meet and talk about my experiences. And then there were uh, assignments that you had to do, uh, like where you had to interview somebody from the company. And that's a great excuse to go bug like the top person at the company <laughs> and really pick their brain because you're a student, you're, like, you're not really asking for much and they want to help. A lot of people, when they get stuff like that, will go pick some lower level person. I say when you get something like that, just shoot for the top. I mean, worst thing they're yep. going to do is say no. And mm -hmm. then you just pick somebody else. Like, who cares? <laughs> so uh, you found a way to make it work. I found a way to make it work. I, yeah, is the point of the story. <laughs> I found no, a way to make it happen. Everybody's like, what are you doing? I'm like, don't like, trust me. I have a plan. You know, I know like, I'm going to like, it's all for, I'm playing a long ball game here. Struggle now and you'll be a champion at some point in the future. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that is so important. I totally believe for the entertainment industry, especially LA it's, there are no specific rules on how to 
get like make your way through. Again, there's certain things that you have to do. You have to follow a certain uh, protocol, but there's so many things in terms of breaking the rules. And as well as I think the biggest way to define it in my mind is like being someone who's resourceful. Like you have, you to, have be to be, you have to be, you have to be, I mean, people want to sit around and make excuses. I, I mean, like on one hand, people might call me a hypocrite or whatever, because I had an in at entertainment tonight, but I still had to ball out at entertainment tonight. And I still had to find a way to make imagine work. You know, you can't roll over, you know, you gotta, you gotta make it work. Um, yeah, you no, just do. I, it's a, it's a it's, fact. <laughs> so Tell me about the last year, because again, you have three years of law school, and then we'll kind of segue into you know the, the bar. How was that last year's school, and did, did you feel like you were kind of in the rhythm and everything? And um, I'm, ju I'm just curious. Uh, honestly, again, like, like so, so I started crushing it in from an academic standpoint during my 2L year, and I held, I think I held off on uh, jobs again because I was you know I like I sucked my first year. And then mm -hmm. heading into that third year, I took on some jobs and maybe that's why my grades took a dip, maybe not. I don't really care though, because I think that those professional experiences helped me just move to the next level. So I think going into my 3L year, I was working at Jerry Bruckheimer Films. I, I pulled the same thing where I was enrolled with College of the Canyons. It was a very similar internship to Imagine Entertainment, Jerry Bruckheimer Films. Jerry Bruckheimer is another one who's arguably one of the most successful producers of our time. And again, going back to making it work, um, I still have to pay the bills that summer. So I was working at Arclight Cinemas as a crew member, like literally picking things up off of the bathroom floor and giving people popcorn. You know, obviously I wash my hands and <laughs> working at one of the most prestigious production companies in the world. So again, like, I don't want to hear people telling me that I just had some cookie cutter thing. Cause that's, that's not true. Um, in the three L year. Yeah. I took some other internships. I was at mosaic media group. They are a, uh, a management company. Um, they manage a lot of big stars in the comedy space and they also have their hands in production. And again, going back to like making it work, I was doing crazy things like getting up super early in the morning to beat traffic to like study before the internship and, and do the internship and come back, which I, by the way, wasn't getting credits for, and then still had to make my school schedule work. Um, and again, like the same themes apply, like going out of your way to show people that you want to work, then you get the cooler assignments. You know, you still got to go out on runs and deliver packages to people's houses and do that kind of grunt work, but it's just part of the game. You have to do it. And then the, uh, at the end of the year I was, you know, I started studying for the bar school, had a program for it. So I was studying for the bar. I was doing this entertainment law clinic. And then I took a, a legal internship at universal pictures. Um, again, just had to make it work. I mean, there were so many days where I would literally wake up at 4am, get like a 30 minute workout in my room, <laughs> drive to drive to LA. Cause I'm coming from orange County, right? Chapman's in orange County. Mm-hmm drive to LA, like listening to a recording of one of our lectures in the car, like get to a coffee shop, study for three hours before work, go into work, do my thing, come back during like rush hour traffic, listening to, to more lectures and then getting the class and making that shit work and still doing the homework. Uh, so yeah, that was intense. And, and maybe my grades, my grades took a dip that my grades took a dip that <laughs> semester, but dude, it was worth it. It was worth it. It was about making it work. Like I made it through. I, I learned the important things I had to learn as far as uh, entertainment law is concerned and, and tried to focus on the bar and, and, and it was what it was. And that's honestly, that's what it takes. That's what it takes, especially if you want to get into this industry. Every industry is a little bit different, but if you're doing all of these things in parallel, that's what matters. I mean, it, it Hollywood entertainment is all about getting your hands dirty. I mean, I've talked to many people who have had different types of careers in this space and no one was like, yeah, you know, I, you know, I got up at nine o'clock. I, I did this. And then you no. know, this opportunity just presented itself. And then I'm super successful. It's like that does, that doesn't happen for anyone. And nah, just dude. hearing that perspective from you is, is so important for someone to understand, like, this is actually what it's going to take. And you didn't just have one internship. You had multiple internships while you were doing your degree, like while you were getting your law degree and, and not all of that stuff was ca like counting towards even having an internship. No. And you found a workaround. Like you were literally trying to make it work, but you were still building relationships, right. you were building relationships. Right. That's, what, that's what LA is all about. 
Yeah, that I mean that's a key thing that we should we should revisit too. I mean, I was involved in our uh, entertainment in sports law society, you know, we'd have different people come in and talk. And again, like another one of the things I'd do is they'd ask for volunteers to pick somebody up from the airport. I volunteered every single time because then yep. you have a captive audience for 30 minutes, mm-hmm. you know, I like hold them hostage and make a new connection uh, like that. Like that's good stuff right there. Um, what, what else with that? Oh yeah. And just then staying in touch with these people from, mm-hmm. I mean, I still, I mean, literally dude, I, th- this week I've talked to people from Imagine Entertainment Jerry Bruckheimer Films and Mosaic Media Group. I talked to people from Universal Pictures not that long ago. So then you maintain these connections. And a lot of people, I think, get freaked out because they're like, oh, I don't have anything to say. It's it's like, yeah, you do. And there's nothing wrong if you lose touch just sending an email to somebody. It's like, hey, so-and-so, I know it's been a minute. I I love to reconnect and just see what you're up to. Let me know if you can chat for 10 minutes. Literally, there's nothing wrong with that at all. And if somebody doesn't respond, you got to follow up. That's mm-hmm. big because even the people I'm tight with, they're busy and uh, they might like you, but believe it or not, an intern is not the top person on their priority list, right? <laughs> they're dealing with all sorts of crazy things. And there were times I got to follow up like three or four times for somebody who actually likes me to get back to me just because shit slips through the cracks or their assistant did a bad job. Uh, but you can't take anything like that personally and you just keep going. Yeah. I, I, I mean... Just to the fact, too, with everything that you were sharing about even being that person to say, hey, I'll do it. I'll do it. Like, that's what people remember you for. Like, exactly. hey, he's the person actually who, oh, wait, Asa, what what, what did he, okay, yeah. Actually, yeah, he was the guy who was always asking us to do more. And he was always willing to do something and go Dude, above and beyond. Like, that's I what did, people remember. I've done crazy stuff. And, like, I mean, <laughs> we could go into, like, I mean, this isn't that crazy, but it's it, it's, like, a little just weird. Like... I, when I was at Imagine Entertainment, they had this room of just scripts that they've compiled, like literally just an entire room filled with, you know, those like filing cabinets. Yeah. And they just filled with scripts and they needed them all labeled, boxed and moved. So I was like, yeah, if you guys let me wear uh, gym shorts and a T-shirt for three days <laughs> uh, or for like a week, I'll literally move boxes for you for a week. And I think that I think they appreciate that. Yeah, it's just like, hey, what needs to be done? How can I help? Like right. always asking that question versus, oh, I actually don't have anything to do today. This is this is great. Like it's 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 an easy day versus, hey, what else can I can do? I, oh, I have dude. time. Yeah. Like, how can I help? Yeah, exactly. And, it, and again, it t- it takes a it takes a certain personality. I definitely think it does. Like you might have to be a little bit more outgoing, or at least be willing to put yourself in those comfortable uncomfortable situations as a person to where it just becomes normal. Because that's what I feel like. That's what L.A. is. It's just a series of uncomfortable situations after uncomf- uncomfortable yeah. uncomfortable situations. Yeah, like, there, it's were never ma- there were there were many. <laughs> there were many, but also a lot of a lot of great people. And and you know the thing. Uh, Something I think a good piece of advice to think about the most is something Coach Regal told me going back to him. And I'm sure mm-hmm. you've heard him say it a million times, but I can I swear I can hear his voice in my head just being like, You gotta <laughs> want it. You gotta want it. <laughs> and anytime I'm doing some stupid thing or I'm up at like four AM or moving boxes, I'm just like, You gotta want it. And like <laughs> this is the stuff that in the moment it sucks, but you look back on it and you laugh and you look how far you've come and you keep moving forward knowing that there's going to be more stuff like that. And I, I, that's my attitude. That's my MO. Like I think that's the way to be. Yeah. I, I mean that, that's just so funny. You mentioned that with Rayle cause it just, Have, it just haven't you heard him back. say that? Haven't you heard him oh, say that? Yes. I mean, I, I, I was able to, you know, just hear that in many different occasions. And I've just laughed about that with so many friends from football too. just be like, you gotta want it. You gotta, you gotta want it. it. Yeah, like, like you're like throwing up at those that. at those like six a.m. practices, and he's just yelling. <laughs> you, you know, all, all in, uh, of course, in like, I, I like I think he really cared about us too. You know, and that's yes. another thing, man. People get freaked out about getting yelled at. I was so happy that I had <laughs> those experiences at Chaparral where I really got yelled at by a few coaches. You know, so you know how to deal with it because it's not like. A lot of people take it personally it's not and personal. th- mm-hmm. there's a difference like there's a difference between somebody who's yelling and berating you to just get off on their own ego and cause they're jerks and to make you feel like shit versus somebody who just doesn't want you to screw up and, and like wants you to succeed. And I think most people fall into that latter category, mm-hmm. you I, know? I, yeah, I, I completely agree. And I think just going, just 
kind of looking at everything that we all go through in our careers, your like your success is so tied to how your willingness to be uncomfortable, like putting yourselves in a position of not feeling like you know everything and not and you know maybe having to do something that you don't necessarily want to do, but you know it's going to just help in the process of getting better and putting you in a position to continually you know, just right. Just like keep moving forward. Just keep moving forward because this stuff is not going to happen overnight. And then it's easy to, to get freaked out and compare yourself to other people. Like maybe somebody gets promoted before you Mm -hmm. and you're like, Oh my God, that guy's seriously, but you can't get, (laughs) you can't get caught up on that stuff or you can't get caught up comparing yourself to the 22 year old billionaires and like, God bless (laughs) those people. And I I really, anybody listening, I hope that you're, I hope that you become one of those people, but if you don't, it's okay because different people experience success at different points in their life. And there, and there really is more to life, uh, than making money. You know, you should be having fun too. Hopefully you can do all of those things. Yeah. uh, I mean, (laughs) <laughs> one of my favorite quotes is comparison is the death of joy. I think it's so true, especially yep, today yeah. where, you know, we live in a society where you see so many, you see every, everyone is on social media. So you see Everybody. what everyone's doing and it's just the highlight reel of look how successful I right. am. Look at, look, look at my life. This is awesome. And it's, it's just, it's, right. again, it's like social signaling. Cause that's just like how everyone likes it, to dude, do it's that. Su- it's way. such bullshit. <laughs> it, it, it's all bullshit. When, when I was in right. college, I really liked being on Facebook and posting, funny things and and, but that was before that there were like these big stars you know and I was Mm -hmm. just doing it because I thought it was funny and it it was really (laughs) easy for me to post funny things and then I kind of saw what it was becoming I got jaded and I deleted all my social media and it wasn't until literally COVID that I got an Instagram and I guess we we can talk about that later there's more things to talk about before COVID unless you want to jump to it I'll I'll talk about it I'll, I'll plug the movie review channel and then justify it after I yeah, just right? shit all over social media, I'll, I'll do I, anything. I think we should talk about that right now, and then we'll switch back yeah, over let's into do it. kind of your process with the bar. So yes, because again, we're all going through this crazy experience with COVID, with things being shut down, working from home. I mean, it, it, this is affecting the entertainment industry probably just as much as it's affecting you know people who are in the hospitality industry, et cetera. But you know, tell us a little bit about the movie reviews i think it's a dude you're 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 great at being able to just like break down a movie and have that personality behind it i'd love for everyone to check it out but tell us about how that started yeah so uh, i was like during covid like a lot of other people you just don't know what to do with yourself and for me (laughs) i'd always been like doing this law stuff and the and the school stuff and part of the film industry, you know, part of the entertainment industry is the creative aspect. And I think you got to have your hands in both. And I wanted to be doing some more creative things. And I just decided, like, I always thought I could be a movie critic because I see the (laughs) stuff that gets posted on Rotten Tomatoes and I either disagree with it or I think, and Rotten Tomatoes, by the way, is rigged, right? Like they Mm. said that some of those Star Wars movies, those newer ones were really good. Like they give them 90%, the critics, that's just not true. Nobody who like did you see those movies? Yeah, I mean the the Star Wars movies. Yeah, I, the I newer saw ones. Yeah, the newer ones. Yeah, did they're you not like them? It's okay if you did. Uh, like you can you can say from an entertainment perspective. Yeah, they're entertaining, but are they as good as the classics? No, no, of course not. Absolutely not, man. That I'm telling you <laughs> that that thing that site is so rigged. So I just wanted to do something where I could basically film myself doing a movie review. I tried to keep it under a minute. And I try to make it entertaining. Um, so I, I, you know, like I'll try to, cr- I try to throw in a joke or I try to wear a stupid costume. And, and you know what? <laughs> Not all of them are hits, to be completely honest. Some of those reviews aren't very good, but some of them are. And at, to this point, I've left them all up, you know? So mine is not necessarily a highlight reel. I don't want to be called a hypocrite. Um, but there's some good stuff on there and there's some not some good stuff on there too. And I also did some uh, sketches with my girlfriend because she, she's an actress and singer. So like we did some funny stuff where we dressed up like Black Widow when that movie got pushed back because of COVID. Uh-huh. And we did another one. The other one I really like is where I was like, uh, she was Gandalf. And I, I think my character's <laughs> name was Stacy. Have you seen that by any chance? I, I, I've seen so many of them. I remember it starts with Gandalf in the beginning. That's what I can remember. Cause I remember watching I, it like I, two, I was three months ago. I was basically <laughs> just like a, like a evil, like an evil blonde, 
young woman who just is mistreating her boyfriend, which was Gandalf. And <laughs> I, I, I did dress in drag, which was a little weird because I, I did a couple of videos where I, or not drag, where I guess I cross-dressed, which I don't know, maybe that's weird. But I had just <laughs> kind of got a couple ideas where I could, I could cross-dress. Wait, that's I the one where you have wine ideas. too, right? You're, you're like yeah. drinking a glass of wine. Yes. I just had a couple Dude, ideas, was... and for some reason, that's a character I'm really good at. I don't know <laughs> why, so I just embraced it, and you know that that's what I did. <laughs> no, dude. I mean, I think just like the creativity aspect of it, and you're in this space, and again, you're doing a lot of different things in law, and and just like working for different entertainment internships, like having a space. I I I talked to so many young people about this, and when I saw that you did this, I was like, yes, another person who is genuinely like interested in this field like putting something that that's unique and i have not seen that many movie type reviews on instagram in the way that you do it in terms of just like having the movie behind you whether it's like an amazon or a netflix and then dude i think you definitely should do more of the one like i really liked was the apocalypto where you're like <laughs> did you like that my scene. girlfriend told me i was insane she literally dude, told me i was insane dude i thought it was just so creative and different like Yes, you do the reviews, but then like taking a scene. Okay, yeah, was that scene extreme? Was a mother giving birth? Was she drowning? Yes, it's it, it was a it was an intense scene. But that's a great movie, you know. But like yeah. doing like pulling those things out, I think it's again it's another piece of content in the fold of just doing your reviews and the other things that you do too with your girlfriend too. Those are great. Like having those other pieces, I think are so cool. Like I, I thought that was like really dude. I'm so relieved. On, honestly, that that stuff like keeps me going. You know, like the positive feedback because sometimes mm -hmm. i dude i mean anybody who's making a product whether it's like traditionally more in the business space or you're doing something creative you put so much work and effort into it and you want people to like it like you do it for yourself but you also want people to like it um so it's rewarding to find out people like especially when you do something just weird like that and like, i'm gonna be real that was a weird weird video that i did but uh <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad it made people laugh you know yeah I'm glad it was dude, it's unique and it, it Again, I think it's so important the personality or the way in which you actually share that information that makes it different and also comedic at the same time. And you have the personality for that from not only just like a movie review perspective, but to take something that's like a little out there but make it also comedic at the same time. I mean, that's what the biggest media companies are doing. I mean, you look at Barstool Sports. They make right. funny out of everything right. in today's world. So you're just picking that genre and, and, and of there's and there's no excuses anymore. Sorry to sorry to no, no, uh, no, interrupt. No. There's just no excuses anymore. I'm sick of, especially being in the entertainment world, I'm so sick of all of these, you know, talented people, but who are wannabe, they're like wannabe established writers, directors, producers, whatever. It's like, I don't care what your excuse is. Everybody has an iPhone. There are movies that are getting major recognition and sold to major streaming services and distributors that have been shot on iPhones, like the movie Tangerine. Um, I, personally, I, I think like it's a good movie, uh, but it was completely done on an iPhone. So you don't have an excuse anymore. I don't yeah. want to hear it. You don't need a million dollar budget. You do it on a no person budget and you have something and you chop it out and that's how you get uh, recognized, I think. I mean, one piece of content can change your life. How many people has that happened to? I, I, like, I bet a lot. Yeah, and I, I really like what you said too. I think this is important. And for everyone li listening into this as well, it's movies, movie reviews Mo with big A's, right? So that's, yes. that's Instagram yep, handle? Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Perfect. But like the whole idea of don't worry about, like yes you want it to hit but just keep putting out content some of it's going to stick some of it's not going to stick but like just the process because let me ask you this how much better do you think you got at it from let's say oh the dude first i'm one so much better 20? at it <laughs> bro I, I used to be a psycho when i was doing it i'll i'll admit i mean there were times ah oh god it's so awkward to admit this publicly cuz it's shameful where I would literally do like 20 takes, just driving myself crazy, trying to say the <laughs> words exactly as I want them to be with the exact pauses. Because the other thing too is you don't have an audience to go off of. It's not like stand up. So it's like literally me and my camera. And, and like a lot of times I'll try to make my girlfriend watch. I'm like, was that funny? She's like, you did it just like the last one. So like, I don't know. Like what? That's the same thing with the movie reviews and be like, are you, do you really want to put that up? Like you're applying to jobs right now and you're, uh, you're about to be a lawyer. Are you, people going to take you seriously? 
And for somebody who wants to work in entertainment like myself, what the way I see it is what type of company would want would like shun an employee for taking a shot at a creative thing who works at a creative company? Seriously? Yes. Seriously, I don't want to work for that company yeah. if that's the case, <laughs> whether it's a legal position or anything else. Like, I don't want to work for you, man, if, if that's the way that you see things. I was going to you I was going to say that as well, too. Like, yeah, if, you, if you're going to if you're going to look at that and judge me on that, then, yeah, I, I don't want to be at your company. I mean, having a podcast for the last two years has not has helped my career. It's helped my career in interviews and all of those other things. So being able to have that creative outlet and it's tied to what you're actually doing from a career perspective is only going to help you. And I think this is so important to talk about. And I'm glad we kind of fit this right into the middle of this conversation that we're having during this time when everyone's kind of staying, staying at home and you're not doing a lot. And maybe you even feel complacent. I mean, I was, I felt complacent at certain times. I mean, Dude, this is affected so us all complacent. in some way, but like having an out, like a creative outlet, like everyone should be doing some type of creative. I, I, that's my opinion. But like, especially if you're kind of struggling and you're not sure what to do, like being able to say, Hey, what do yeah. you really like? Why don't I just go start talking about that? Yeah. And it's going to make you feel a little bit better. I mean, have you felt like, has this, has this project since its inception made you feel just like better, more inspired? I it mean, gives I me, it gives me a program. sense of accomplishment. It gives me a sense of accomplishment. I don't care that I only have 400 followers. It gives me a sense of accomplishment because I know that it makes people laugh and I know like I, it does what I set out to do. It's like I wanted to make people laugh and for people to have somebody that they can count on to give them a truthful movie review that's entertaining. And I, I get messages all the time from people that are like, I was going to watch that movie. I'm not watching it anymore. That to me <laughs> right there is like the best compliment I could have got or like, oh, I didn't know if I should watch that. Like, I'm going to check it out. And then they get a message. They're like, oh, that was a great movie. And uh, those are the best compliments that I could get because it's exactly what I set out to do. And it was hard to do. And it's not like I'm making any money doing it, but it's still is a sense of accomplishment. Like it's like going back to what we were talking about before. It's not all about the riches. Sometimes you should just do stuff for you. Yeah. And I mean, the other side of it too is it, it's, it's still helping you. I th feel like be able to formulate ideas, be more creative. Like it's, it's right. squeezing that, that creative, you know, that creative juice in you. So exactly. there's that inherent, um, intangible, if you will, that like, People will look at it and be like, "Why are you doing it? It's not making you money. Like, isn't that's like that's a waste of time?" It's like, no. How it's is like, this no, a waste dude, of time? It, like, it's for me. Yeah, it's like some yeah. people like like, dude. Maybe there's a world where would I be mad if the world ever happened where you know I only had to work three or four hours a day, like watching a movie and reviewing it, and I made a comfortable living. Would I be mad? No. But is it what I set out to do? Like, no. You know, so I'll just keep doing it because I like I like doing it. If that happens, then like we'll cross that bridge if we ever get there. Uh, but I'm not just gonna like put stuff out to put it out. And you know, like I've had people giving me good advice, like you got to be consistent, you got to put something out every day. And like sometimes I don't have anything to say, or sometimes I don't have time to watch a movie. You know what I mean? Dude, yes, I think not putting the like the like the strict, okay, I need to make this much comment. No, you don't need to make, you can make as much content as you want. Again, comes back to why did you start it in the first place? You don't need to listen to people who are like, you need to make content every single day. You need to do this. Like, what's the bigger plan? What's the bigger mission with it? It's like, dude, it's, I'm just having fun, man. Like I, I'm doing right. something. And again, like you said, that, and I know that too, like that one person or that, that the couple people that actually reach out to you and tell you, dude, thank you for letting me know this. Like, I'm not going to watch that movie or, Hey, this, this, I didn't even know about this movie. Like that's, that makes it worth it. It's not, it's not about the masses, especially in the beginning. It's just about the little like things that you can make the little like pieces of right. feedback that you can get from people, which inspire you to keep going. And I mean, that's what you were sharing earlier too. So that's, that's, I, I think that's so important. And I mean, I, I remember going back through some of your, your, your movie reviews and there was one, I think it was called like Beasts of No Nation. I oh, seen that that's movie. the one of the dude. It, that is literally one of the <laughs> best movies out. Period. Dude, and I haven't even seen it. I didn't even know about it. And you told period. me about it. I love Idris Elba. Like so again, like that's it's important. Bro, he he would have won. He would have won an Academy Award if people had been a little more uh, had been accepting Netflix a little more at that point. Because at that point, I think that I think that he was really the first. 
I think that was really the first like original that they did. Don't quote me. But okay. then Will Smith, I think, was considered the first like mainstream A-lister. Bam, bam. I, I consider Idris Elba an A-lister too. But I think uh, Will Smith's, what was that movie called? Uh, where he was like the, you know, the cop or whatever. But anyway, I, I think had uh, the Academy been more accepting than Netflix at that point, he would have won uh, an Oscar for Best Actor, no question. Okay, I need to watch this movie then, man. And it's I'll, dark I'll though, dude. Feedback. Be warned, it is. It's dark. <laughs> okay. Um, hey, if if it's a great movie, I think if if there's an amazing movie out there and it might be a little bit dark, I think it's it still warrants watching it, especially if you are someone who really enjoys movie what, movies, which I am. So agreed, agreed. So yeah, that's kind of the movie. That's the movie review thing. And I, I'm glad we, I, I'm glad we talked about it. I know it's kind of coming into the fold here again. If you guys want to check it out, is movies movie reviews with Big Ace? Yeah, that's, that's right. That's that's the uh, that's the handle on IG. So we're gonna take it now back to taking the bar exam. Right, let's back talk to, a little oh, bit dude, about that. The bar, my my arch nemesis. <laughs> There's nobody I hate more than the California bar. So let's talk about the California bar and and what it is for people who don't who don't know. It's it, it's this extremely hard test. And the way I describe those law school exams where you come in and you write those essays, right? So you there's an essay day. At, this is how California works. There's an essay day and there's okay. a multiple choice day. On the essay day, you write five normal essays, just like those essays I described to you that you do in law school. And then the sixth essay, you have an hour and a half to do opposed to an hour. It's called a, a performance test where you get like a packet. For example, you have like a, a, a fake email from some firm you work at or a judge and they tell you about some story or some facts and they hand you like a transcript of a client interview and then they give you like some black letter law to sift through and you gotta like research all that shit and put it together. Uh, in a memo or whatever it is that they're that they're asking for or a motion or whatever and you don't know what it's going to be so the only way to study for that part is to just practice it again mm -hmm. if you had all the time in the world to do that last one everybody wouldn't blow it out of the park but y you only have an hour and a half and that makes it extraordinarily tough so that's the first day and that's a you gotta remember that's one day six and a half hours of writing essays uh you have a hour break in the in after the first three hours okay that's the first day Jeez. the second day is 200 multiple choice questions. You have three hours per 100 question. Um, and it just sucks. I mean, the, the test is designed <laughs> to shaft you at every possible corner. Uh, like the multiple choice kind of tests more details in the like minute areas of the law and tries to trick you on things that maybe you wouldn't catch while you're just trying to fly through these questions that if you do the math, you only have a minute and 47 seconds to answer on the multiple mm -hmm. choice. Then the essays, again, it's curved against all the other people in California. So you're just racing to get the most points and you're freaking out because like this time it's for real, you know, <laughs> this time it's the, it's the big leagues. And I took that bad boy four times and finally passed. Jeez. So which one would you say was more difficult on because again, you have the essay day and then you have the multiple choice. Was there one that was a lot more difficult for, for you? For me, I struggled more with the multiple choice. And again, like all these things are weighted. So you don't have to, like you could crush the essays and do really bad on the multiple choice and still pass the bar. Or like oh, you okay. crush a few essays and like fail an essay, but because you crush the other one so hard, you're good. Does that make sense? Yeah. But for me, I, I really struggled with the multiple choice for whatever reason. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just tell you my bar story. So the first time taking the bar, I was kind of like following the program that our school had. And there are these like, uh, what are they called? Um, like commercial packets or, or like these commercial courses that you can take that are pretty popular, like Barbary or Kaplan, whatever. And okay. we had a course with our school, Professor Monero, who's actually a great professor. I love that guy. Um, kind of doing his own thing to supplement that. And I think where I shot myself in the foot the first time was his strategy was wait until the last like two and a half, three weeks to start memorizing and just really try to understand the law up until then. For me, I knew that was a mistake. I think I needed more time to memorize, but I was a little, um, maybe I was a little just insecure because it's the California bar and you just want to trust the process. And I was hesitant to trust myself in that mm -hmm. moment when I should have been trusting myself. 
it also didn't help that my dad was murdered, like literally straight up murdered in the middle of studying for the bar. I think had you taken that episode out and, you know, the shock of losing, you know, my father, uh, obviously an extremely important person to me while you're studying for the bar. I think even if you took that out, I would have failed by the way. So I'm not using that as an excuse. I really don't think I studied the right way. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think I studied the right way. I think I studied my ass off. I don't think I studied the right way. And then I guess the second time around, I was like, all right, this time I'll trust the process, you know, whatever. Maybe it was because my dad died. Maybe that psyched me out. Um, and I'll start memorizing earlier. I tried it. I studied my ass off, failed again. Um, oh, I, I guess we can circle back, but it, well, I was working at a, uh, uh, an agency in mm-hmm. between that, but I'll just tell you the bar and circle back. The third time I said, screw this, I'm going to try a new program. I tried it and my score improved, failed again. Each time my score had been improving. And at this point, dude, like, you want to talk about um, thinking about quitting and resiliency <laughs> and stuff like that, dude. Like you got to remember, you, you study your ass off for like two and a half, three months. You know, you're putting in 10 to 12 hour days, like using every waking minute that you can to like organize your day to just study, study, study and to fail, uh, just hurt so bad, man. It like, like you just want to cry. Like you just want to, uh, like you just hate yourself for failing and, and wasting right. your time and your money and you got to get a hotel. It's a fucking mess. Um, <laughs> the fourth time no, like it is, it just sucks. <laughs> and, and by the way, like it's common for people to fail it, you know, once or twice, I would say taking it four times is not necessarily normal. However, with that being said, I'm proud of myself for passing that and being somebody who took it four times because I didn't quit. I knew I could pass it and I did. So the fourth time I got a private tutor to work with me like, you know, like four hours a week and tell me kind of what to do in between and just really do my own program. And after having tried a few different programs and having a little more guidance from a private tutor, then I passed it. I don't know what score I got because they don't tell you, but I can tell you that I passed and now I'm a lawyer. Thank God. (laughs) Dude, and congrats. And again, such a long journey to get there. But again, like you were saying, like the persistence. And I I, I do think, and I'm I'm not saying, you know, again, the passing of your dad had an effect on that. Again, I think that would affect anyone. And again, you there's there was a lot of things going on but also like just the environment that you're in in LA and all of the things you're trying to juggle at the same time make it a little bit more difficult I'd say than let's say someone who was in a you know a smaller town who their singular focus is getting their getting their law degree and and passing the bar and there's nothing else like dude LA, you're juggling a lot of different things. Well, and- I just want to—I I gotta be clear. So Chapman is based in Orange County, you know. But like, yeah, I mean, if you want to call it LA, some people still do. But there's a lot going on. I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, because I mean, weren't you were still going back and forth? You weren't just—you weren't just there hanging out all the time. Like you had different internships well, throughout the process as well, too, right? So, well, well, when I was studying in uh, the last semester, you know, I was doing the internships and running around and being crazy back and forth to LA. But in the summer, I was just strictly on that. After I graduated law school in the summer studying for the bar, I was just strictly focused on the bar. And I think that's the only way to be unless like I know some super Saiyans, you know, just some like wizard (laughs) smart people that I went to school with that also had a job. And again, God bless those people. But uh, like 95 times, 95% of the time, you are not that person. Yeah, no. I, I mean, again, it's, it, it, did you, did you also have to, is there a, is there a waiting period from being able to take it again? If you do fail the first yeah, time, the second time? That, yeah, it sucks because they, <laughs> what they do, there's, cause there's a million people taking it and they got to review everybody's essays and nobody's, nobody wrote down the exact same essay and like I said, who knows how they grade the thing. Then they got to curve it all. And they have like multiple people read your paper. So if you take it in the summer, it takes like four or five months to get, just get the thing back and find out if you passed. So that first time around, I was working at UTA, which is a big, um, which is a big talent agency. I was working for the head of business and legal affairs in the production department. Great job. Awesome people killing it loving life, getting to do a lot of cool things. You know, again, still got to do some of that grunt work, but getting to do the cool things. Like now I'm in it. I have arrived. Mm-hmm. I've, I've made it to a talent agency and I'm doing law stuff in entertainment. Like, yes, I am here. 
and to fail, it's like, oh my God, I have to go back. And there's not really a way you can do both. A talent agency is a demanding place. Um, Mm -hmm. Fortunately, I'd done well and they were willing to give me like a grace period to go study, take it and come back, which I did. And then, then I failed it again. I failed the thing (laughs) again. So that then is number two. And like at that point, at at that point, you know, I was just like, I'm not going to keep doing this to these people and nor am I going to continue to asking. It was, it was like a unicorn to ask them once, you know, I I feel like it would be inappropriate to go back and keep asking for that after, you know, I'm shown that I can't like, (laughs) like the bar, like, you know what I mean? Like I think I can be trusted on anything else, but that test, man, like I wouldn't expect somebody after I failed it twice to be like, all right, we'll give you another grace period. And like, we'll roll with the temp for the time being and let the business suffer while you try to figure your life out. I'm not going to ask for that again. (laughs) Um, So what I did do between the second and third test is I kept my foot in the game though, still kept my eye on the prize. And I got myself in with a temp agency that's focused in uh hollywood you know just like entertainment type business so i worked at all these different production companies and they loved me because i came from a talent agency i was able to just drop right in and just do whatever it was that they were asking me to do and then i also um pa'd on a lot of sets which is called you know a production assistant and that's like Mm -hmm. the epitome of grunt work you're literally like moving things around and setting up shots and taking things down and bringing people coffee and driving people places and the hour the days can literally be like 17 hour days so i was doing like music videos a couple tv shows um and i think that oh i did a couple commercials and then i did then because i failed again i failed it a third time and i did the same thing the third time again while staying in touch with with everybody uh, you know, keep my head in the game. Then I take it the fourth time. I'm like, I got it. I passed. I made it. <laughs> I'm ready to move on with my life. I, I finally did it. And then COVID happens, dude. <laughs> and the world stopped. And the world has said the world, like, this is where we are. Like now we're in the present, right? Now I've brought us up to where we are. COVID has happened. And I'm like, fuck, like, what am I, like, what am I going to do? <laughs> like, this was my time. I was ready. I had stayed in touch with everybody and I'm ready to move on with my life. And, and you just can't. Um, so then, then that's when I got crazy. Like that's when I started going with the movie reviews. I started training for a marathon, just to, like keep myself busy and active and, and disciplined, not to be complacent, kept reading the entertainment news every day keeping in touch with everybody I know in entertainment from all my previous jobs, like reaching out to new people, writing cover letters, sending in resumes and what might be the worst economy of all time, not of all time, but at least in our generation's time Uh to be applying for a job. And only this week uh, did I have interviews and I haven't landed a job yet. I had, I had an interview uh, with one company. I don't want to say which. I don't. I don't want to jinx it or stir up any extra comp- unnecessary competition. <laughs> the first company, I'll just call it established company, had a good interview. That was kind of with uh, like more um, like the HR types, which for me I can handle, but it's always a little more uncomfortable to me than just an interview where they just kind of want to shoot the shit and see if right. you can just talk and like like hang out or whatever. Cause again, like they're hiring a person, not a resume. So for me, it's like, yeah, it's a little uncomfortable to be like, all right, tell us about your experiences. Cause I'm like, well, what do you mean? It's all, it's right there. It's on my resume. Um, but I, I, I think I navigated it well cause I got called back for a second interview, which is going to happen on Monday. Uh, fingers crossed that goes well. And I had a different interview with a more, a newer company. I was called a startup company. Um, um, that I think it went well, they're, okay. They told me they're going to send me some additional materials to review as kind of like a basically a round two. And, um, you know, we'll go from there. And I and I guess talking about getting those interviews again, I was just I was just pumping out cover letters, emails, asking people, hey, what do you know? Who's hiring? What do you what do you know? Um, and just trying to keep my ear to the ground. And for the, the big established one, I sent it in. You know, there were like a million people that applied. I went in via LinkedIn and contacted the coordinator of the department directly and just reached out, introduced myself and said, Hey, I I, like, if you feel comfortable based on this conversation, this intro, I'd really appreciate it. If you could pass this on to whoever needs to see it, because going back to, again, what we were talking about earlier, 
so many of these things, especially in entertainment, are connection based. And I'm just worried that somebody's even going to see my see my stuff. I mean, I don't want to sound <laughs> arrogant, but if you look at my resume, I think just on paper, as far as you know, like a lower level job is concerned. I, I think I have the skill set to do anything that they want me to do. You know, all those internships, I'm, I'm a lawyer. I've worked at the talent agency. I've, I've been on set. Like I can do it. I can do what you're asking me to do, but there's so many people applying. I just like, I need this to be seen. Um, so I don't know if that's what got me the interview or if the HR people saw it straight up when I sent it in normally. Mm-hmm. Um, but I got the interview. And then the second one I did through, connections. I had, uh, you know, he had me apply to a job at this company before they said, no, you know, I said, no problem. Thanks for for keeping me in consideration. Then he said, Hey, there's this other position that popped up. Would you be interested? I was like, absolutely. Um, you know, we go from there and now here we are. It's like, that's like literally this week. (laughs) <laughs> I know. And it's, and again, we'll have you on in like, a, cause I I'll sometimes bring guests back on like a year or two later just to see like what's happened. So we can definitely maybe discuss that as, you know, we get out of the yeah, like Where is he in. now? <laughs> yeah, it's exactly, weird. Exactly. I feel like I've just been ranting. I mean, I have a lot, I have a lot to talk about, you know, but I, like, I've done so many things, but at the same time, I feel like I've done nothing. <laughs> you know, does that make sense? No, it does. But Asa, I'm so happy that you just did rant for a little bit about what you've gone through because I think it's so important to give context to anyone who's listening in that I love hearing stories that have two things that are the common themes of those stories. It's constant struggle and uncomfort and difficulty. And again, your story is no different than that. I mean, you've gone through a lot of different stuff. The amount of times you've taken the bar, the amount of different things that you've had to juggle through this whole experience. But then also the other side of the coin is resilience. Like resilience. Mm-hmm. And I wanted, to, I wanted to ask you this question too, just hearing you share about the ups and downs. And um, was, there any, was there a point in time where going through the failures of having to take the bar over okay I can't now work at this agency anymore because it's taking me more time was there ever a point where you were like you asked yourself or you thought I like should I go do something else like did that ever come up or was like talk to us about that, that. that's like like yes and no um for me personally just the way I am the way I was raised it's like I, I don't know here's here's my mantra not to get too preachy and it's something my dad used to say to me. It's, it's try your hardest. Don't say can't be nice and have fun. And, th- and those things have steered me pretty well. I just try to remember that through, through everything good and bad. And just for me, like I'm, I'm confident. Like I know I'm putting in the work. I know I'm going to get to where I'm supposed to be. I know that there are going to be shortcomings and failures along the way. I know that the road curves, things don't happen overnight. So even in my most um, insecure moment where I'm feeling down on myself, I still know that I'm going to be successful because I know that I'm going to keep going. I think that anytime you have a failure, it's okay to be upset. People are like, don't be upset. Well, it's like, well, you're invalidating my entire thing. Like, it's okay to be <laughs> upset about things um, and, and feel down, but like, don't stay there. Like, that's good to do for, do it for a day after a failure, do it for a day and then get back on the horse. Cause if you stay in that place, like it'll fester and it's like a cancer and you, and then you're just stuck, then you're stuck. And then that's when you veer off the path. And I think, uh, start to feel like shit about yourself, but I wouldn't know. Cause I've just kept going. Yeah, no. And again, I mean, someone might also be listening to this too and say, I mean, how do you even continue to keep going through all of those setbacks? And I mean, do you have, would you have any feedback for someone bracing to go into something where they know they're going to be struggling there? Like, were there any things that you did to keep yourself in the right headspace when, whether it was like a form of like keeping consistent with the workout routine or like, how did you, cause again, it's one thing to just, you know, keep your head in the right space, but were there things that you tried to do to cope with it? Or was it just, you know, learning? There, as you no, went? there's nothing really like specific, you know, there's no like special, sauce, you know, like, like I, I, like I stay fit, you know, stay connected with people. And, and I guess the one piece of advice is just keep going. Cause even if you look at me, like I'm talking like, like I've kept going and I've done stuff, 
But mm-hmm. in reality, all I've done is internships. I've, I've became a lawyer who's helped some people so far on some small things. I worked at a talent agency, which is an accomplishment to break into. Uh, it's a very difficult thing to do, but you know, you're like a low level assistant. Nobody knows who you are. You're not a power player. Um, and you know, I've done some temp stuff and worked on sets and, and I like, I've learned a lot and I feel like I'm like still building the foundation. So I know that there's even, there's more to go. There's much, 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 much more work to do. And my hope is that these uh, companies that I've applied for and I've had interviews with will see that I'm, I'm a resilient person, somebody who wants to get things done, somebody who wants to learn. Yeah, I had some setbacks with the California bar, but you know what? That's a, that's a hard fucking test. I can do this job. You know, I, I did well at the talent agency. I'm a lawyer. Like, what else do you want from me? I'm resilient. <laughs> I, I like, I, I try to be nice. I try to have fun. Like, like what, like what else do you want? So, you know, balls in your court. I hope that they make uh, the right decision, but if not, I wish them the best. And, and I'm sure they hired somebody else for a good reason. And I wish that person the best too, because I know I know that I'm going to make it. Like, I just believe in myself, you know, I, like, I don't want to sound preachy again, but like, that's, that's just what it is. No. And I, I love that too. Cause it's like, Hey, there's no, there's no hacks. There's no tips to this whole thing. There's no routine to get around. It's like, you just keep going. Like, I mean, dude, like, you know how going. it is. Like you, I, I always <laughs> see you talking about this type of stuff and I see your brother talking about it a lot too. Like if you don't believe in yourself, who who's gonna believe in you? <laughs> right, you're you're that you're the only one who's gonna believe in yourself. Like There's you're, no one like, else. you're <laughs> like the like literally the only thing in the world that you have absolute one hundred percent control over is is like the choices that you make. That's it. Mm-hmm. Everything yeah. else is just an illusion. That is the only thing that you have one hundred percent control over. Yeah. I, I completely agree. I will. I, I am curious too. Again, I know there's only so much you can share about that, but are you able to share what types of like jobs that you are going for now or like a high level around that for, for the viewers? Cause I know you have this vast career in the entertainment space. You've, you know, taken so, on a so lot one of, of them jobs. is with a studio. One of them okay. is with the studio and um, it, it's more of like a traditional, you know, business and legal affairs role. And then another one, the other one is with a company that's doing something unique in the industry. They've been around for a while, um, like close to 10 years, but they're still, you know, relatively new. They are doing some cool stuff. They are doing some cool things though. And, and that job, that interview was actually really interesting because I don't even think that they know exactly what they want me to do. I think they're like looking for a <laughs> utility guy that can do it all, which I'm, I'm, I think I'm like, nailed that That's interview because I'm, I'm just fucking like i'm like, like yeah dude like I look do no it further um um but yeah it's so like like in the interview the guy was really funny he goes he's like I, I don't remember what i said but i said something along the lines of like yeah and like whatever it is that you guys are offering he's like oh are we offering something and i go i don't know you tell me i still don't know what this job like i don't know what you want me to do exactly i'm just telling you everything i can do and i'll do anything that you want me to do and we'll we'll go from there you know <laughs> i love that that's that's the mindset you need to have like again you'll you'll figure it out but i mean just going through everything that we've all had to go through, especially once you got over kind of the hump of like the failure after failure. And then it's like, I passed. And then like COVID happens and like having to deal with that, doing like having that creative outlet to create the movie reviews, I think is awesome. But then like you said too, Hey, I'm still staying in touch with everyone. I'm still trying to connect. Like everyone's at home. Everyone has access to their phone. Now, no one's going out. This is a perfect time to connect and network. Perfect and time. We're able to do that. And now, right. you know, that, like as we're having this conversation, this week is when you have had these interviews and now things are moving forward, even though, you know, California is like locked down again, but you're still making that right. progress too at the same time. Bro, I'm, I am, uh, you know, I want to make these things happen and I'm doing my absolute best. I mean, like an interview again is only so much in your control, like, right. You can choose your response and your choices, but at the end of the day, it's not your decision who they hire. All you can do is make your case. And if they don't, pick me um you know like that that's on them like like i i don't take it personally it's got nothing to do with me i've done everything i could do to this point and if it doesn't work out with them it'll work out with somebody else and then they'll 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 probably won't remember that they passed on me but 
you know, a lot of people passed on Tom Brady too. I'm not saying I'm Tom Brady. <laughs> I'm just saying sometimes people miss stuff for anybody out there uh, who's been passed up on jobs and, and is struggling right now, like myself included, I'm struggling. I don't have a job right now. I'm trying to make things happen, but all we can do is keep moving forward. I, I'm 100% with you, man. So I have a couple more questions and then we can conclude. Uh, first question and... I'll just tell you this right now. I'm, I'm going to edit this par- portion out because you can tell me before you answer it if you want this to be included. Um, but the question I was going to ask is, you did mention this on the podcast, and I feel like it is worth bringing up to at least address in, in some sense. But I know as you were going through the bar your your dad had passed away and this happened in i believe 2018 it's 20 it was around 2018 uh, honestly dan i don't even know it's been like two years i think it's been two years i okay. I, I don't even know yeah but okay. yeah I, yeah i think I, you're right 2018 yeah and again i have no idea what that's like i can't imagine what that experience is like but you brought it up and I, I'm, I'm sure if anyone who's listening into this podcast would just want to know like again like dealing with that situation i know you already kind of answered that but um, I definitely wanted to give you a space to at least talk about your dad, the man he was, how he influenced your life. Because again, just he, again, we weren't extremely close growing up in school and being able to connect with you and through social media and now having you on this podcast and really getting to hear about how you've kind of progressed in your career, man. I mean, it, it's so inspiring to me as another individual on Thank my you. own separate jersey. Like, yeah, no, I'll, I'll, so talk, I'll talk about it. I haven't really talked about it anywhere uh, publicly before, but I'll talk about it now just because and you can include all this. Um, when it, when it happened, obviously it was a shock and, you know, I mentioned what my dad did and, you know, that he worked on some high profile cases. So the joke that we like, we made fun of him a lot and called him like a D list <laughs> celebrity because he was on CNN with Anderson Cooper and he was on like MSNBC and Dateline right. and all these different things. And people did know who he was. Um, but I, but I don't even remember where I was going with that. Where, where was it? What were we even talking about? Um, yeah. Oh, I remember. Well, it was just so crazy. The reason I didn't talk about it before is is a couple of things, right? Because like, even though he was like a D list, C list celebrity, is the joke. He was so many more <laughs> things than that, but th- that's the joke. Um, it was a fucking. It's like a media circus, dude. Like, I'll, I'll just mm-hmm. talk about it. this. Has nothing to do with really um, work and whatever. I just kind of want to talk about it because we have so many things going on in our country, and I don't want to get too political. But I will talk about the news cycle. And just tell you personally, uh, from somebody who witnessed a national story that was on, like my dad's murder was on CNN. It it was on all the local news channels. There were uh, news crews at his funeral. I was getting called um, by different news companies asking for interviews. And just being surrounded in that, you know, quote, circus is what people Mm -hmm. call it, that quote unquote media circus. I didn't want to talk about it. There was a lot of things going through my head. And then also just after seeing some of the things um, that were reported on my dad, like nothing, uh, you know, negative about him, but some of the things like people coming forward and speaking out on behalf of my dad, like claiming that they're my dad's friend or something like that. And meanwhile, I know for a fact that my dad did not like that person and hadn't spoken to them in X amount of years. Mm -hmm. Um, and, And, you know, like things like that and just, you know, like whatever, just craziness. And like, even the media, like being at the funeral misquoted shit that my brother and I said, I have the tape, dude, I have the tape of the funeral and they still manage to misquote things. And I guess my point about that is just the news cycle, man, we like, we see what they report. It's on you to really do your due diligence and try to look into the facts as much as you can, because we're just getting a report. They don't know the full story. Okay. The news doesn't know the full story and neither do you. So just do your best to try to look into things and educate yourself and think about things logically and not necessarily like assume that the things you see in the media are real. Because I know for a fact, I know for a fact coming from the inside of something like that, that there were blatantly things that were said in the media and that people said that were not true period. Um, so I, that was a little rant about the media and why I hadn't spoken out 
up until this point. Yeah, so my, my dad was murdered. And, and and to be completely honest with you, Dane, I've looked into it and read about it before. I mean, I was there, but I don't even know the guy's name who murdered him because I don't care. I've read his name before, but I don't care. I, all I know is that somebody murdered my dad, uh, a mentally ill person murdered my dad. He was involved. Um, and, and a, by the way, a string of other people too. I, a lot of times it's really easy for me to forget that there were several other people killed, yeah. I believe five or six. And again, like, I don't want to sound, um, ignorant or, you know, like lacking any compassion for the other families and, you know, people that were affected by this tragedy and what this guy did. It's just like in, when something that crazy happens, you just don't care. Yeah. You know what I mean? You just don't care. Um, yeah, man, it was, it was just crazy. Like I remember finding out out of nowhere, like I had a bunch of missed calls from, uh, you know, my, my dad's fiance. I just call her my stepmom because like, I don't really like to explain, like, it's just annoying. I'll explain it here, but I, like, I'm always going to be like, yeah, my uh, dad's fiance, but they didn't get married. <laughs> but I just like, we, we still stay in touch. Yeah. Right. No, I call her my stepmom. So my stepmom, uh, I had like a bunch of missed calls. I was like, fuck, that's not good. Um, picked up the phone or I like called. I was like, what's going on? She tells me and like, you don't believe it. You can't believe something like that. she's like, so, you know, like I didn't heard back from your dad. He always calls me when he's leaving work. I started to get worried. I went and checked on him. She rolls up and there's just like a police chaos scene happening down there. And, uh, she told me, I don't know. She's like, we don't know much. Somebody murdered your dad. And in that moment, you know, first of all, you don't believe it. Then it's sinking in and I'm thinking, okay, my dad's a friend's psychiatrist. He's, he's interviewed, you know, like fucking murderers, which I guess we'll get back to what this guy was. This was actually like a divorce thing apparently. Yeah. And the guy, it was like a civil thing of all the things, you know, my dad has interviewed like murderers, rapists, serial killers, like fucking psychos. Uh, and like, you would think it would be from a criminal thing, you know, if somebody was going to come out and get him. And he did take a lot of precautions to, to be safe. And he knew that was a risk, but from a civil case, can't, can't really say that I saw that coming. Um, yeah, I don't even remember. I'm just ranting. No, so and, and what was I, what was I saying? Like, no. Oh, just hearing about it. Everybody was, a. I'm just thinking like everyone's a suspect or like, was it professionally done? You know, like I'm checking my window, right. just freaking out. Um, yeah, man, it was just crazy. It was just it's crazy, but that's what happened. It just like is what it is. That's what happened. Crazy yeah. guy murdered my dad who was mad yeah. and mentally ill and falling apart after his divorce and losing custody or whatever. Literally stalked my dad and a bunch of other people that were involved in the case and murdered him outside of his office. And another thing that's crazy and how this actually connects to to me or at least someone I know too outside of you is one of my best friends his mom it was actually the the lawyer involved in that case so Ethan Friedman's mom I, I don't wait know was she was Ethan. she murdered too no 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 so there were two paralegals that were right that right I do know office, that but they right. actually weren't in the office at the time that that happened mm. when uh you know Dwight, I think it was Dwight Jones was, was the guy's name that he actually did that, but it was at their office. And that's when I heard about everything when it was like, my mom just told me, she's like, Hey, did you hear about what happened? Like that's Ethan's mom's law firm that happened. And then it was connected to another guy who was like a psychologist, um, you know, outside of your dad on the, on the, the psychiatric side, like there was a psychologist that he went Psy psychiatrist. I, yeah. I, I just had to correct you, but cause my dad, he wouldn't, he would want me to, but no problem. Oh no. Well, yeah. When I say, when I say psychologist, there was another psychologist murder. Oh, there was. Yeah. So, so look at me, dude, look at me just sounding ignorant too. <laughs> no, um, no, 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 um, no. But yeah, again, like I said, I didn't pay attention to really any of this. I didn't pay attention to it. Yeah, no. And, and, and I get that, man. And I, I, I can't, again, I can't relate in terms of how I would even deal with something like that. But just, again, hearing you talk about your story and like how you've continued to do your thing and continue to move forward, despite like, again, this, like something like that happening, it's just, it's so, it's so honorable. And just, I mean, man, I, I'm, it inspires the heck out of me. That's why I love doing stuff like this. Again, just hearing about people's stories. And I will ask you, cause I know you wanted to give a little bit of context to the story, but 
one other thing around your dad. Was there anything, you know, just like thinking about him in terms of the person yes, he was? Yes, I do want to. Yeah, I definitely want to circle back to that. I just got crazy talking about no, the murder, totally but that, cool. but that I think makes sense. I think people will understand that. Yeah. Um, no, man, my dad was literally the best person. I, I mean, I mean, period. I know that's a cliche thing to say, but the guy busted his ass. You know, he was from like a middle class family in Detroit, like bust his ass, you know, like found his way in into med school, you know, built this practice out for himself was just huge on working hard, no excuses. You're not a victim. You know, you control your own destiny. That was like his thing. And just like, be nice to people. Like that was it. Like those four things. It was like, try your hardest. Don't say can't be nice and have fun. That was my dad. Cause for as serious as he could be, and he could definitely be a hard ass on me and my brother and in his work. Um, he was like the funniest guy and he, he was so funny and everybody knew that he was funny. All my friends knew he was funny. Uh, the people that he worked with loved him cause he was funny. The police loved him, you know, cause like he did good work. He's mm -hmm. a serious guy, but he also knew how to like let back and have fun and he instilled a lot of those values in me and it's kind of ironic that my dad was so big on like not like don't have the victim mentality and then you know being a victim of a murder sure. but then circling back to that like when my dad was murdered i went home for a week and then i and then i went back and started studying for the bar wow. again because like what else are you going to do are you going to sit around and pout like what like what is that going to do for me yeah. You might as well just try to keep going forward, not to say like to forget the memories of my dad because I don't. I think about him every single day, but to just keep pushing forward, you know, because like what else, what are you going to do? Like somebody breaks up with you, your, your your parents die, you get fired from your job. Like it really doesn't matter. You don't you don't have time to sit around and sulk about it. So, you know, I think about him often, you know, I can like hear things that he's saying to me maybe when I'm being an idiot or I'm being complacent, <laughs> like I can fucking hear him, you know, like, like saying stuff to me, uh, like no excuses, work harder. Or like, did you really try your hardest? You, you know, like some stuff like that. I can hear him. Um, and also just like guiding me. Like I went to him for so many things, just guidance, like how to handle a personal thing or something in the workplace. And I just think about like what he would have done and would have said. And, and I usually go from there. Yeah. And I mean, just in regards to just hearing how you're, you know, talking about your dad and the man he was, that's exactly probably what he would want you to do. Absolutely. That's a huge part of it. For sure. He wouldn't want us to sit around and pout me or my brother or my stepmom or, or anybody else to sit around and sulk. I mean, it's definitely sad. And I, I like, I mean, we all think about it all the time but it is what it is and you got to keep going. And that's kind of, I don't know. I feel like that's the theme of this, at least this episode <laughs> of the podcast. No, totally, man. And again, I, I appreciate you, you know, being open to, to share this. I know we're deeper into this podcast. So if you've listened this far, um, you know, it, it, it's just really interesting to hear there. Everyone has a different story. Everyone has a different path, but the same type of things get us to, to the end destination when it comes to, you know, being able to struggle, being able to be resilient and things of that nature. So again, man, uh, I appreciate you, you know, being, being open about sharing that, that side of, you know, your personal journey, because again, it's, it's been a, it's been a, one of a lot of different challenges and difficulties and, but there's so much that has come from it and so much have you been able to do and what's, what's, what's in the future. And I'm, I'm super excited to hear about, you know, what the next six to 12 months look like for you and landing a job and doing all the other things that you want to do. Still seeing you do those movie reviews. You can't stop that. Man. I'm not, I don't want to don't stop. <laughs> I mean, this week I have been focused on preparing for these job interviews and like getting that done, but I, I don't have any intentions of stopping. There's just uh, sometimes though that like, they're just putting out so much shit lately. Um, yeah. that, like some of it's <laughs> disgusting, dude. I like I, some of this stuff. I'm like, Oh God. <laughs> Like when it stops becoming fun and I just know I'm like, I'm about to be ambushed by a horrible movie, you know, like some of them, you see here in the reviews, like I lower my expectations for some of them. So if I'm surprised, great. I try to say something nice. Uh, sometimes it's rough, but yeah, definitely, uh, Palm Springs. I didn't review it on Hulu. Hilarious. I, I haven't figured out how to review comedies yet. Cause it's like, it either was funny or it's not right. Real after I did it. It was hilarious. And I want to catch that Tom Hanks, uh, movie in that in that um charlie's movie was horrible i watched it you can see the reviews up i fell asleep like i was watching it one late one night later 
at the end of the night with my brother and I'm like, this is like, okay, it was interesting in the beginning. I liked like the fight scene that was going on. But then as the story went on, it was, I know. I, know. I, I saw your view on it too. And I was like, I agree. It's like I, spot I, on, I, right? I, like, what wasn't that? Wasn't that fight yes. scene though on the airplane pretty sexy though? Wasn't that like pretty sexy? Yeah, like that was it like was the supposed highlight of to the be. whole. Oh, dude, for sure. I, I like it peaked after twenty minutes. I'm like, get out now because it's not getting better. <laughs> yeah. Well, Aza, I have one last question to ask you, and then we'll wrap up here. But I ask everyone this on the podcast, and. I'll ask it to you too. It's it's not maybe the best question. And I know, you know what? We'll change up the question. I think it will be more yeah, applicable to yeah. anyone listening in, especially being in this space that you're in. If you had to share one piece of advice to someone coming into the, the, the given, let's say COVID's not happening and it's just, you know, we're, everything's open, we're doing our thing. And someone was sitting down with you asking, and they're young and they're asking you for a piece of advice on what would you like? How, like, how do I break in? What do I need to do? What yeah. would you share with that person? Um, I would tell them this. I would say, don't be shy. Reach out to everybody you know in the space. Find out people's emails, whatever you have to do. Be, be scrappy. Be scrappy. If I had to say it in <laughs> one word, be scrappy. Find ways to meet people. Don't be shy about introducing yourself. Read the entertainment books and uh, be willing to do the grunt work. Um, those things. Yeah. I yeah. love it, man. It, yeah, I mean... and do it for the right reasons, too. You won't make it if you're doing it for... Like, if you just want to be in it to be like, oh, I'm in Hollywood. Like, look at me. Like, yeah, you're going to hate your life. <laughs> you're gonna, you're literally going to hate your life because you could do... Trust me, you can make a lot of money doing not this. And uh, you'll put up with like less than half of the bullshit. Right. So just make sure you're doing it for the right reasons. I, I, I love that. I love that, man. And then the, the final thing is, if anyone wants to connect, reach out to you, what's the best way to do that? Oh, yeah. Um, I would say I would say now just DM me. I can't believe I'm saying that. Or, <laughs> or via like email or my cell phone. But I don't, I don't want to just throw my email out nah, to the world. Yeah, I get you it. You know I what I mean? It. Dude, but they, like, can, they the, can start with Instagram. They can yeah, start, start with, the with movie Instagram. Reviews. Don't be shy. Like, if you want to talk to me, you can talk to me. Go go watch my movie reviews and send me something, and I'll, I'll talk to you about breaking into the entertainment industry. I'm happy to do it. Seriously, I'm, I'm like totally happy to talk to anybody. And that's a step in the direction of being like getting scrappy with it. Right? I don't get, have your email. Get scrappy, okay. dude. It's like, you, like there's my there's my. You? If you don't have an Instagram, get an Instagram. I don't <laughs> fucking care. Like, you know what I mean? Yes. No. Yes. And it's movie reviews with big A's. Movie reviews with big A's. It's public. You don't even have to add me to send a message. You can just do it. I'm available. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm here. And I'm happy to help. Seriously. <laughs> Asa, it's been such a pleasure, man. I mean, just again, we, it's been a while since we've been able to connect with everything. Everyone's doing a million different things and just hearing your story. Uh, I, I know, dude, it's inspired me so much and I, I hope it has for anyone who's listening out there too, to just continue to pursue what's genuinely interesting to that person and what they're curious about. And it just goes to show you, man, like anything you want, you can make happen. So thank you so much for coming on today, man. Dude, thank you for having me. Yeah, this was fun. I hope I didn't uh, rant too long. I, I hope I didn't sound arrogant or anything like that, but I just Not try to all. tell it how it is. And, <laughs> and, and I, hope the, I hope the right messages came across. And that is going to conclude my conversation with Asa Pitt. I hope you enjoyed it. Again, like he said, if you want to connect with him, you want to ask him about the lawyer route, or you want to ask him about the entertainment industry, he's willing to give feedback as so many other guests are on this show. So you know where to find him. Send him a DM on Instagram, movie reviews with Big Ace. You can find him there and you can get a sense of who he is. His, his personality comes out in all of those reviews. And I love what he's doing as just another little side thing in the entertainment industry. So reach out to him there. Again, it's movie reviews with Big Ace and he is more than happy to help you along your journey. Lastly, before you leave, if you wouldn't mind subscribing to the Young Wilder Rich podcast on iTunes, Spotify, wherever you listen in, that would mean the world to us. And if you could leave a review, that would help us even more. Thank you again for your time and your attention. Look forward to seeing you in the next episode to come. Cheers.